Hello and welcome to the Drexel interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the University's Picture Gallery. Today our guest is Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute Science Museum in Philadelphia. Derek Pitts, welcome to the Drexel interview. Thank you. Well, you are uh, the uh, celebrity astronomer of the Delaware Valley, if such a thing is possible. Uh, tell us what that means to be chief astronomer at the Franklin Institute or a major science museum like the Franklin Institute. What it actually means is to enjoy the opportunity to present this particular discipline in such a way that it can be made accessible to many different people around the Delaware Valley. The objective is to see to it that we can heighten people's awareness about astronomy in a way that is comfortable for them. Astronomy is often seen as being a very complicated topic that not many people can understand. Uh, I believe the opposite of that. It is complicated, but that many people can understand it if you approach it in a certain manner. And so um, the position at Franklin Institute affords me that because there are a number of different resources and assets that the museum has that I can use to accomplish that. Well, that's interesting, and I, I assume then, as the popularizer of astronomy, in a sense, you, um, you have enthusiasm about it that goes way back, that you, you fell in love with astronomy at some point very early in your life, I assume. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got into this line of work? What made you fall in love with the sky? Is that what they say? Uh, well, sometimes people might say it that way, but for me it was a, a different sort of a thing. I've always been interested in space science and astronomy, and it was really the space science part, I think, that led me to the astronomy. Uh, in my youth, I was very much interested in the space program, and uh, for some reason decided that it was very important for me, uh, gosh, as early as eight or nine years old, ten years old, to try to memorize as much technical detail as I possibly could about uh, rockets and rocket systems at that time. Uh -huh. And um, I think what this did was satisfy my technology side. The intellectual side became curious about the night sky, what it was we were trying to achieve by launching people into space, the exploration of the nearby satellite, the moon, exploration of other solar system objects and so on and so forth like that. So I became intellectually intrigued with the, with the universe. What is the universe? Why is the universe? How is the universe? And how does that relate to our everyday lives? So from a young age, I was very much interested in trying to understand this universe that we're part of. So these were intellectual questions first, and then I guess you moved into the telescope and looking at stars and so forth. Yes, very much so. Huh. I was uh, on that side of trying to understand, as you say, the intellectual side as opposed to the mechanical side. I, I do have a, a very strong interest in mechanics and technology, mm. and that you know, serves its purpose to help me in telling the story of the intellectual side. Uh, and I suppose that uh, you know, one might say I'm, I'm a technician at the same time because of that deep interest in, interest in the technology of space exploration, both telescopically and physically, sending people into space. Well, did you want to be an astronaut at some point? Yes, I did <laughs> want to be an astronaut at some point. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, for a young African-American in the United States in the early 60s, it wasn't, it wasn't the first thing that came to mind, the, hmm. uh, the opportunity to become an astronaut. You know, you don't see role models in, in that particular um, occupation, so it's difficult to imagine yourself in that place. Uh, so uh, when I look back on it, I always say, if I had known then what was possible, uh, I wouldn't be where I am now. Huh. I would be working for NASA. I would have been an astronaut. Uh, and all but the what's that the point of that. would, could have, would have when you're doing something so exciting it's here not now? To, it's not to say that what I'm doing now isn't very exciting. It is in every respect because I do have the intellectual side. And I also, a part of that intellectual side is that I get to uh, share my joy and appreciation and enthusiasm for that intellectual side with others in the hopes of encouraging them to have the same feeling. And it's not difficult for people to grasp that if they have a little bit of a window of opening that works for them. But at the same time, I also satisfy my technological side because I do have fairly good connections, pretty good connections for me 
with the NASA side of space exploration, and with the satellite manufacture and launching and astronauts and the space program and so on and so forth. I'd say the only part about that, uh, or you know, I haven't become an astronaut, but I'm way closer than I ever thought I really would be. Well, may, perhaps it lies in the future. It's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to tell us a little bit about the Hubble telescope. There's a big article in the New York Times today about um, the, what went into that pro project. Um, I had no idea that it was a, such a huge, uh, both scientific and bureaucratic, struggle to get that telescope out there and then of course you know to have the problem with it as a result of what they explain to be budgetary and um, uh, t time constraint problems. Uh, can you tell us about what the state of that that great device is at this point? Are the repairs done and is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? That's a very interesting question. Hubble Space Telescope um, will achieve its 100,000th orbit uh, coming up in the next week or so. Hmm. And no idea. That's a tremendous milestone. And over that period of time, its history of, uh, what is it, 15 years now of operation, Hubble Space Telescope has made incredible strides in helping us understand how this universe operates. There's no question at all that the, the number of discoveries made by Hubble Space Telescope are almost uncountable. The imagery that it has provided is unbelievable. It currently is in a fairly bad way. It has a number of dry rows that aren't working that help to stabilize it and help steer it. A number of its imaging systems are not working right now. Its batteries are running down, so on and so forth like that. However, there is one more repair mission coming up in just another month or so. And this repair mission will essentially return it to its original state because all of the optical, almost all of the optical components will be replaced. New gyro systems will be installed, new guidance systems, uh, almost everything will be new except for the mirror in the telescope. And this will extend, uh, this will extend the telescope's life uh, another five to maybe 10 years or so into the future. So even though this is the last repair mission coming up, and the future shows, I mean, we, we can see that there's a new telescope on the drawing board being manufactured right now. Even after the launch of that new space telescope, Hubble Space Telescope will still be operating and still be providing tremendous amounts of data. And that new telescope won't be for another five to 10 years? Yes, that's right. It'll be, launched, it'll, it'll be launched in another five years or so. Uh, and it will have a longer lifespan than Hubble Space Telescope will have had. But just the same, Hubble's work is not done by any stretch of the imagination. And the amount of information that has come down to us from Hubble Space Telescope is enough to keep uh, graduate students busy for decades. Really, really. Is there anything in particular that you would want to point to or that you yourself find of particular interest that has resulted from that, that uh, telescope? Uh, I'll point out three things. One of them is the work that Hubble Space Telescope has done helping us understand what the most distant reaches of the universe look like. There had been speculation estimates uh, for a long time about the number of galaxies in the universe. Hubble's ability to image the deep universe has helped us to understand very clearly uh, that it is a vast number of galaxies, that number of 50 billion is not an outlandish number for galaxies. So that's been a tremendous assistance. Um, helping us to understand more about the origin of the universe is another major component uh, of information that Hubble has provided. And um, in my mind, one of the other things is Hubble's ability to help us understand that supermassive black holes are located at the cores of most galaxies. Mm -hmm has also been an important step forward in our understanding of how galaxies exist in the first place and what may happen to them. So uh, it was in through the Hubble, Hubble's telescope that the black holes actually became apparent? I didn't know that. No, it's no. actually the, the, the fact that we've been able to determine that there are supermassive black holes at the core of most galaxies. We've known that black holes have existed theoretically, theoretically. and there have been uh -huh. indirect observations. But that existence of black holes has always been coupled directly with individual stars. And so the black holes have been rather small. 
These are enormous black holes that provide the power to allow galaxies to do what they do, to create stars by the billions. And so that's a very different sort of a, a, a thing altogether to get mm -hmm. your head wrapped around it. This it's is hard for me on. to wrap my head around it, but it sounds exciting. I yes. will say that. Yes, it is. Um, it is an exciting time for astronomy in general. I mean, this latest discovery of life on Mars. Could you speak to that? Now, that excites us immediately, but what does it mean? Is it as exciting as it sounds? I mean, to somebody like you who knows technically about this kind of thing, are you as excited as, as, uh, as we are who just hear, hear about life on Mars? I am really excited about the possibility of finding something, uh, either finding life existing on Mars now, or finding evidence that life did exist at one time. One of the other really wonderful things about this story is if we look closely at how NASA is pursuing this topic, how NASA is doing the research on Mars, you get to see very, very clearly how science works. Very methodical, very careful, trying not to lead us in any one direction without enough facts. And then once the facts are there, clearly stating what the case is. And here's what I mean by that. Although we want to believe that life did exist on Mars at one time, or that life now exists on Mars, we haven't found any evidence of that. But what we find are the telltale pieces that le would lead us down the path of supposing that there's an environment where this could happen. How has NASA done that? They've done what they call follow the water. Every step in their research along the way so far has been to establish that at one time, there was a lot of water on Mars in a liquid form. Now, we can look at the landforms that we see in the photographs and immediately interpret that that was the case, but we really have to pay very close attention to exact evidence of that. And NASA has been able to identify two or three examples of this exact evidence. So now there's no question at all that at one time in Mars's history, it was wetter and it was warmer. And that leads you to the possibility that there was an environment in which life may have developed. So now we have to hunt for that. So we haven't gotten to the point yet where we can say definitely there is or there was. But we've tied down every lead that puts us in that direction. So now when we start that specific work, we can be assured that we've tied down everything ahead of that. And that's very important. Uh -huh. Because life, finding life someplace else, is not the sort of story that you want to release unless you've tied down every possibility, every one. But look at how carefully you have qualified this situation, which we, the lay people, hear and we think, I guess we think of Martians. Yes. <laughs> um, when you're really <laughs> talking about the possibility and the movement toward the notion that some sort of life mm -hmm. might exist, that is less uh, dramatic. Uh, but I, obviously for a scientist, it is dramatic. I mean, for, for us, we're thinking of, uh, we, we want something a little bit more tangible. Oh, absolutely, because what we've been, uh, what we've been raised on, actually, is the Edgar Rice Burroughs no uh, novels <laughs> about uh, civilizations on Mars, and we've looked at, uh, you know, Flash Gordon on Mars, and we've seen, even if you will, from the Bugs Bunny cartoons, uh, Marvin the Martian, <laughs> and all these other things, uh, yeah. all the great novels about the possibility of life on Mars. That's what we want to see immediately. Uh -huh. But the reality of science is that we need the factual evidence, and then once we find it, once we find it, with proof that it either does or did exist, it will be even that much more remarkable because the environment on Mars is nothing like what we've ever seen in any of these novels where any of these great civilizations on Mars has existed. So <laughs> it will make science even more riveting than the fiction right. because life could possibly have developed under these conditions. Uh, under conditions that one would think would not be necessarily conducive. Oh, let's think about it. It's 150 